I'm very interested in your research on sexuality. Um, I, uh, I think people around here will, will say I'm very open about my sexuality. What I mean by that, I'm straight, but I'm, you know, my past couple of girlfriends uh, have, are pretty kinky. Not pretty kinky, but I always say that the kink that I enjoy is within the confines of sexiness. I know that's weird to say, but I've been to like fetish parties and there's some things that are just like, to me, ridiculous. But um, I do see a, a, a very just hot uh, sensuality to, you know, basic BDSM. Most of the sex I have is fairly vanilla. But when I do have kinky sex, it brings me to the present. It's, I'm, I'm in the moment even more so. My mind wanders off less and my mind tends to wander. What are your thoughts on, on what kinkiness is and the rise of BDSM with, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey and all that stuff? Are, are, are more people more kinky than, than, than we think? Probably. I think Fifty Shades of Grey has done um, some good things for the kink community. So, I, I mean, I've studied kinky sex. I always tell people, and they never believe me, but I'm very vanilla. But I find, you know, that research really interesting. So I can't really speak for my personal life. But in terms of seeing how, say, the BDSM community has responded to that franchise, in some ways it has helped, I think, to, to widen the exposure and to kind of uh, advocate for sex positivity, which I think is a good thing. Um, in, in some ways, you know, I think... There are aspects of the community that maybe have not really been presented uh, in a mainstream way as much yet. Definitely, I would say BDSM is central in terms of consent. So it's a little bit different from, say, sadism or masochism, which is where you are either inflicting pain on your partner or inflicting pain on yourself, and there's a lack of consent there. So BDSM, right. as I'm sure you, as you know, it's there's a lot of um, negotiating. There's safe words. It's a very controlled environment. Yeah. So, and I, but I would say in terms of the spectrum of, say, atypical sex, BDSM can be, it depends on, on uh, how extreme you can go, because it, it, there are definitely aspects of BDSM that are more, uh, how would I say, expert, you know, like piercing right. or um, there's some things that are, are a little bit riskier to do. So it sounds like you may be on the less risky end of the BDSM yes. spectrum. But uh, I think in terms of, say, atypical sex, BDSM would probably be the most common nowadays. How do you think porn has affected sexuality? Hmm. I think the harms of porn have been overblown. I think it really depends on the individual person in terms of how porn affects them. I don't think it's accurate to say that porn across the board is harmful. Um, say with so-called porn addiction, there are no legitimate studies to show that porn addiction is a real thing. If you talk to anyone who struggles with excessive use of pornography. So I, this was part of my work for my dissertation. Um, so these men would spend upwards of 12 hours a day masturbating and looking at pornography to the point where they wouldn't be going to work and right. it would affect their relationships. It's usually almost always about procrastination and anxiety and poor coping skills. It's not about being addicted to pornography. But because sex is stigmatized, the thing that people latch on to when someone has a problem with porn is that it has something to do with sex. So that's what people focus on. And so you see these treatment programs where men are being shipped off to deal with a so-called sexual problem. The problem has nothing to do with sex. It's that they're stressed out and they have anxiety and they need better coping skills to deal with their anxiety. Dr. Deborah, you are a voice of reason in this crazy, crazy world. You're in Toronto, right? I am, yes. Amazing. Did you grow up there? I did. Awesome. And wh what's, your, what's your ethnic descent? Uh, I always make people guess. <sighs> so, um... This is probably the, the least... You the look, least you you look like Taiwanese. I get Taiwanese a lot. I'm actually Malaysian Chinese, but I was born in Canada. Okay, you were born where? In Canada. in Canada and Malaysian Chinese, you know, I have a, these are, these are the regions that in the world that I, I believe produce the most, the sexiest women, if not the most beautiful women in Latin America is Colombia, Venezuela in Europe. It's the Eastern Europe, like corridor, you know, that, that, because, and then in Asia is Southeast Asia. So like, you know, Taiwan, Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thai. And I think it's because in all those places, a bunch of different cultures and races collided. So, yes, I, uh, you're a beautiful woman. I hope that's okay for me to say Thank that. You. Thank you for being here. And for people that are interested in, in, in more from Dr. Deborah, so um, she has a podcast called Wrong Speak. Uh, you can also catch some of her columns on Playboy.com as well as other journals, and you can look her up on Twitter. She's the only Deborah So that I know uh, that is, uh, you know, this uh, rising in profile. Thank you so much. And Thank I'll you so much. And I'll be contacting you uh, by email with when we're going to put this up, and, and you can share Okay, then could, for my for social media, can you put a link to Dr. Debrisseau for Twitter? Dr. Debrisseau, absolutely. Yeah, 
Okay. Thanks a lot, Doc. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Bye. Bye. -bye.